Hello and welcome to Intermediate Financial Accounting 1 Tutorial 16C. This is the last of three tutorials on inventory costing methods. In this tutorial we will focus on costing inventory using the FIFO periodic and FIFO perpetual approaches. There are two learning objectives for this tutorial. The first is to determine the cost of ending inventory and cost of goods sold under the FIFO or first in first out periodic costing approach. And the second is to determine the cost of ending inventory and cost of goods sold under the first in first out perpetual costing approach. As with tutorials 16a and b, this tutorial follows the Newman Valve Company example. And our third requirement here is to determine the ending inventory value and cost of goods sold for the month of August, assuming the company now uses the FIFO periodic costing approach. What we will see here is using the FIFO periodic approach, it's the same initially as the weighted average periodic approach. So we begin with our beginning inventory. That would be on August 1st. We have 500 units at $15 for a total beginning value of $7,500. Then we have our first purchase on August the 10th, 250 units at 17 for $4,250. And then the second purchase on August the 25th, 100 units times $20 for a total of $2,000. As we saw with the weighted average periodic, this gives us cost of goods available for sale, sometimes referred to as COGA, of 850 units at a total cost of $13,750. So now here's where under FIFO things change a little bit. Up to this point of cost of goods sold, this was the same as the weighted average. But now, instead of calculating an average cost rate, which we don't do, we determine how many units are in ending inventory based on the cost flow. Our ending inventory consists first of 100 units at $17, because what happened here is we had 850 units that were available for sale, but there were 650 units sold, if you recall from the other tutorials. So that gives us 200 units in ending inventory. And that 200 units is actually split based on 100 units at $17. And then as you see in the next slide, another 100 units at $20. This inventory exists and a portion of this inventory exists at $17. So we have 100 units from this bank of inventory on the second purchase because of the 650 units sold, the first 500 in inventory are gone. Our inventory consists of 100 units at $17 for a total of 1,700, plus an additional 100 units at the $20 from the August 25th purchase. That gives us a total of 3,700 units in ending inventory. And as you can see in the cost of goods calculation here, there were 650 units sold in total, 200, in the first sale were at the $15 and in the second sale the remainder of the units in beginning inventory plus a portion of the $17 inventory was sold. So in our ending inventory again we have 850 available minus 650 sold is 200 ending and that's broken down like we have it here. On FIFO our ending inventory is always based on the most recent purchases because in FIFO first in first out so the beginning inventory was in first and then it was gone then the first purchase came in and some of it was gone on the first sale and some of it remained after the second sale and then of the last purchase on august 25th all of that inventory is left okay and now for our final requirement requirement four again ending inventory and cost of goods sold this time using the fifo perpetual costing approach as before, we begin with our beginning inventory, 500 units at $15 for a total of $7,500. Then recall our next transaction is a sale of 200 units at $15, leaving us with 300 units at a cost of $15 because that's what's left from this bank for a total of $4,500. Then on August 17th, we have a purchase of 250 units at $17. Our balance now, and this is where you have to really kind of pay attention as to what's happening with FIFO. With FIFO, we have to keep separate the beginning inventory and the new purchase. We know that after the first sale and then the purchase, we would have 
300 units plus 250 for a total of 550 units. And you recall under weighted average is that we determined a single cost for all 550 units. But now that 550 units is actually split 250 at $17 because that's how much our firm has purchased. And the remaining 300 units at $15 from the original bank of 500. After our purchase, we have 300 units first at $15 plus 250 units at the $17. Our inventory at this point is still 4,500 from the remaining bank of $15 inventory, plus the additional 4,250 from the August 10th purchase. Our total inventory at this point is $8,750. Then on August the 17th, we had a second purchase, this time 100 units at $20. What we have now in inventory is 300 units at 15 of 4,500. That's where this comes from. Then 250 units at 17 for 4,250. That's where this comes from. And then finally, the 100 units at $20 for 2,000. That's where this comes from. Total inventory at this point, 10,750. Now we have our second sale. We sold a total of 450 units. But now under first in first out, we know we have a bank of inventory sitting there going all the way back to a portion of the beginning inventory at $15. That's why we have to keep track of this and why we try to make it clear by putting it in this orange shaded area. So the first 300 units comes from the $15 inventory. 300 units times 15 gives us a cost of goods of 4,500, leaving us zero units of the $15 inventory. So now we have finally gotten rid of all of that $15 inventory that was there at the beginning. Then the remaining 150 units comes from the next block of inventory. The next 150 units comes from the 250 unit inventory that was purchased for $17 way back over here on the 10th. We have 150 units at $17, giving us a cost of goods sold of 2,550. This leaves us with 100 units because we had 250 minus 150 equals 100 at $17, giving us $1,700. And all of the $20 inventory remains. So there's another $2,000. So after the August 30th sale, we have $3,700 of inventory, and we have 100 units at 17 and 100 units at 20. And now we can calculate our total cost of goods sold. Going back through the transactions, uh, we have a sale here. 200 units at 15 is $3,000. Then our next sale had the first 300 units at $15 for 4,500, plus an additional $2,550 based on the $150 at $17. That gives our cost of goods sold value of $10,050. Now we can go through and actually prove our ending inventory. And if we follow the approach that we did for weighted average perpetual, we begin with our beginning inventory, 7,500 beginning inventory, and that's what we have over here. Then we added our purchase of 250 units at $17. And so here was our first purchase for a total of 4,250. Then we had a second purchase right here of 100 units at $20, so that's 2,000. And then we subtract the cost of goods sold over here that we had from the previous slide, cost of goods sold, and that will give us $3,700 ending inventory, and we know we are correct. Now that we are complete in having calculated the ending inventory and cost of goods under all those methods, we can now just have a quick peek at a summary of them all. Recall in tutorial A, we covered weighted average periodic. In tutorial B, we covered perpetual. And in tutorial C here, we're covering both the FIFO methods. As you can see here, the approach is very similar to begin with. We start with the beginning inventory for all of them and then add purchase for all approaches. So the cost of goods available for sale is the same under every single method. This part is not changing at all. 
What does change, however, is our inventory and cost of goods sold because of the costing approach taken. Now, the differences between them are not necessarily very large, but what you'll also notice right away is that the FIFO periodic and FIFO perpetual approaches yield exactly the same ending inventory and cost of goods sold. So on an exam, unless you are asked specifically to determine the cost of goods and ending inventory fully showing the perpetual approach, why not just do it using the periodic approach because you end up with the exact same answers anyway. It's the weighted average approaches that cause you some grief. Remember with the weighted average periodic, we can calculate a single rate and that makes calculating the cost of goods sold and ending inventory very easy, but under the weighted average perpetual, we need to calculate multiple rates. What we also see here is that the similarities in terms of the costs of goods sold and ending inventory, the difference here is not even $100, so the results are very close. What you do see, though, are substantial differences between weighted average and FIFO, and this is only because weighted average will contain an average of all the previous purchases, whereas FIFO will contain only the most recent bank of inventory. So depending on what the average cost is, these approaches could all be very similar or very different if each purchase ends up uh, being at a different cost, significantly higher or lower than the average. We really only have one key point to remember for this tutorial, and that's under FIFO periodic and perpetual, the cost of goods sold and the ending inventory are identical, meaning that the ending inventory under both approaches or the cost of goods sold under both approaches are identical. So that concludes tutorial 16C on the first in first out approaches for inventory costing using both periodic and perpetual.